Good morning. It is good to be with you all this morning. Um, I also get to be the guinea pig trying out the new location, I guess, of the placement here. So if I fall back, I've asked some people here to step in for me. So the sermon will just keep going. So it'll be fine. Um, this morning, if you want to follow along uh, in your Bible uh, with the passage, I'm going to be, we're going to be going to a few places, but if you want to follow along, the main passage that we'll be in this morning is in John 21, verses 15 through 19. So you can go ahead, if you want to follow along in your Bibles, turn to John 21. You can stay there. Most of the other passages, I believe, will potentially be up on, on the screen, so you can follow along, but, but you don't need to be flipping around, around with me. You can just stay at John 21 throughout this morning. Um, at Willow Creek Community Church, uh, every fall, they, they do what's called a, a leadership summit. It's a conference for, like it sounds, leadership development. They have a phrase that when leaders increase, everyone benefits. When leaders get better, everyone benefits. And, and at this conference, Bill Hybels, the senior pastor there, he always gives the first talk. And it's really good, it's, but it's always the same. You always know what it's going to be. He's going to have his easel set up, big piece of paper. He's going to get his large Sharpie. He's going to draw an L graph on there. He's going to write the word here at the bottom part of the graph, and then there up here at the top part of the graph. And he says, what is the essence of leadership? If you were to boil leadership down, what is leadership? Is it, is it controlling things? Is it saying, I'm the boss, so you've got to follow me? He says, the essence of leadership is taking people from here to there. Here to there. He says, before you can ever tell anyone about the there that you want to move people towards, if you, if you start, if you tell them too early about the there, the same question will always come up, and that's, well, what's, what's wrong with here? We like here. Here's safe. It's comfortable. We know here. What's wrong with here? And so he says, before you ever mention the there, you have to make this airtight, undeniable, biblical reason for why you can no longer remain here. And then once people understand that, that they can no longer remain here, they'll start to say, what are we doing? Where are we going to go? We can't remain here. And then you say, well, how about we go there? And then people are willing to go there. So this morning... We're going to hear a story, we're going to see a story, a true story about where we get a glimpse of someone moving from here to there, in the process of going from here to there. And to give a little bit more background of this story before we get to the main focus in John 21, we're going to start back um, in chapter 13. We're going to be following Peter in his interactions with Jesus. And so first, we're going to go to John 13, and in this story it reads, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. This is Jesus speaking. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Then we're going to skip ahead just a little bit farther this time. Now we find ourselves at John 18, and this is the scene that Jesus just predicted would happen. So Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty, and brought Peter in. 
You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire that they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing there with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there, warming himself, and they asked him, You aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, a rooster began to crow. And in Luke's account of of this story, he gives the extra detail that at that last moment, right after Peter denied Jesus for the third time, Jesus is being taken in, and they actually turn and make eye contact with each other at that moment. And now we find ourselves at our scripture this morning. So fast forward. So that right there is the rooster crows, you could say, is the beginning of Good Friday. Because later that day, Jesus is taken, he's beaten, flogged, wrongly accused, eventually crucified, and dies, buried. And then on Easter Sunday, he rises from the dead. And he starts to make his appearances to his disciples and his followers and to different people. And where we find ourselves this morning in our scripture, John 21, it's uh, the third time that he's making his appearance to his disciples. The disciples are out in a boat. They've been fishing because they're fishermen. And uh, they see someone on the shore who's created a fire and has got breakfast cooking. And they realize that it's Jesus. So they rush to the shore and they've just finish, finished eating breakfast. And this is where we find ourselves this morning at John 21. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, Do you truly love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, Do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, Feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then Jesus said to him, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's something that we miss, actually, when we read this in the English. Because as Peter and Jesus are going back and forth with Jesus saying, do you love me? Peter saying, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. There's actually two different words being used here that we translate as love. They both mean love, but different, they, they carry different connotations, different characteristics of love. The first one, the first one of the words here is phileo in Greek, which is a, a brotherly, sisterly, best friend type of affectionate love. The type of love you might have with a best friend. It's where we get the city Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It's phileo, Philadelphia. That's where it comes from. And the other word is agape. It's this godlike uh, unconditional, self-sacrificial, willing-to-die-for-someone type of love. They both are good, but, but the phileo love has these conditions around it. It's, it's an affectionate, good love, whereas the other, this agape love, is this unconditional type of love. And there's a progression of these two loves here in this passage. Because when Jesus first asks Peter, do you love me? He says, Peter, 
do you agape love me? Do you self-sacrificially love me? And Peter responds with, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo, love you. And then again, the next time Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter responds with, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo, love you. And then the third time when Jesus asked Peter, Jesus this time says, Peter, do you phileo love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. It's as if he's saying, search my heart. You know everything. You know that I phileo love you. And I think that in that moment, Jesus was meeting Peter in his here. He was meeting Peter where he was. And this is what Jesus does. Jesus meets us here this morning, in our here, wherever you are. Doesn't matter if you're 100% all in with Jesus or you've been denying Jesus with the way you live your entire life. Jesus meets us all here this morning. And it's interesting that Jesus doesn't say, Peter, are you sorry? Peter, will you promise to never do that again? But he says, Peter, do you love me? Because Jesus primarily wants our hearts and love, and then the obedience will come, but he first wants our love. Just picture the last time that Peter was around a campfire with people around it. The last time he was sitting around a campfire with other people around it, he was asked the same question three times. Hey, weren't you one of his disciples? No, I don't know him. Weren't you one of his disciples? I don't know him. Weren't you one of his disciples? I don't know him. And here Jesus sets up almost the same scene And this time he just says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. In John 14, verse 15, Jesus says that if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And then the writer John, in 1 John 4, 8, also writes, If you do not love, you do not know God. For God is love. Jesus just meets Peter in his here and just says, do you love me? But Jesus doesn't leave him there. Because remember, this is a movement of here to there. He meets Peter where he is in his here, just like he meets us here this morning, wherever we are but he doesn't leave us here. It's interesting to think about this scene also because this is the resurrected Lord. This is Jesus in his resurrected body. And Jesus' resurrected body still has all his scars, the holes in his hand, the pure side you can put your hands in it. The scars are still there. It's as if he can... He's just showing Peter, I relate to you. I am human. I relate to you. I saw an interview uh, a couple weeks ago of Tim Tebow. And he, in this interview, talked about, Tim Tebow was this super successful college football athlete. He, He won national championships, all these awards. But he said that when he was in his success as a football player, No one could relate to him. His relationships were all distant. And it wasn't until he tried to make it in the NFL and he started to get cut from team after team, got traded to another team to then get cut from that team, that people finally were able to start to relate with him. And he realized that that's something that we all have in common. We all have our own types of scars and failures. Because Jesus was able to see Peter's potential even in the midst of his failure and knowing that he was going to deny him, Jesus saw Peter 
saw the image of God in Peter and was able to call that out from him. An, an earlier story, if we were to have read, read it, there's, there's one where Jesus tells Peter, he says, you are the rock and on you will I build this church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's a pretty big praise. He was able to see Peter for who he was and say, you are the rock. But then not just the next chapter later, same page probably in your Bible, Peter messes up so badly that Jesus calls him the devil. I don't know if you've ever messed up bad enough that someone calls you the devil, but that's got to be a doozy. But he's, he's the rock, but he still messes up. But Jesus saw his potential. He says, that's where I'm going to get you. We're trying to move you from here to there. Which reminds me of one of my favorite stories ever, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. There's a character in these, in these stories uh, named Edmund. And in the first book in the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Edmund is not your favorite character. He betrays his family, betrays Aslan, and uh, yeah, he's just a bad guy. But in this, in this story, Aslan forgives him, and even though he betrayed everyone, he's forgiven, he's reconciled back to everyone, and Aslan gives him the name Edmund the Just. And I just thought, that's kind of crazy. But then the more I thought about it, he really would be the most just because he knows what it's like to be the bad guy, to be the betrayer, and then to be reconciled back to God. Because Jesus sees our potential and he meets us where we are in our here, right now, this morning. I think Peter's response to Jesus was even better than he realized. Because he said, Lord, you know all things. Search my heart. You know where I'm at. Right now, I phileo love you. You know that. And in that moment, in that moment where Jesus sets up the same scene where Peter just not too long ago, denied Jesus three times. Jesus sets up the scene and he lets him know that you are fully forgiven. And in this scene, we get to see Peter fully reconciled back to God. And at the end of this passage, we hear Jesus say, follow me. Because remember in that earlier passage in John 13, Jesus said, you can't follow me now. In fact, you won't. But a little later, you will. We get to see Jesus say, follow me. And that same question is the question that Jesus asks us all this morning. As he meets us here, wherever you are in your here, he meets us all and says, do you love me? Follow me. Because God, God is in the business, though, of growing trees. What I mean by that is these things take time. There is, there is there is the reality of the, of the follow me is an instant thing, but it's a journey. God grows trees. I don't think it's a coincidence that the Apostle Paul uses fruit as the, the symbol, the image of, of maturity in the faith. That the fruit of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Fruit takes time. Trees take time to grow before they even produce fruit. There is no fast lane maturity, fast lane here to there. Because we all have some growing to do. We all have some maturing to do, no matter where we are this morning. I mean, Peter still isn't even perfect. When Jesus, at the end of this passage, says, follow me, he's still not perfect. He still has some growing, some maturing to do. Later on in, in Galatians, the Apostle Paul tells us a story. Uh, it, it's almost, you could picture it, it feels like it's a junior high lunch scene where Paul and Peter are sitting in a group of people, but they're sitting with the Gentiles. The Gentiles aren't really the coolest cats on the block. But then James and all the cool people start to show up, and Peter is a little embarrassed that he's sitting with the uncool kids. So he gets up and he goes and sits 
with James and all the cool kids. And Paul has to actually rebuke him and say, hey, what's up? You live like a Gentile, you eat like a Gentile. What's going on? Peter still isn't perfect. There's one other progression that takes place in uh, this passage that we read. And it's the one that talks about the lambs and the sheep. Because when Jesus says, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus first says, feed my lambs. And then the next time he says, take care of my sheep. And then he says, feed my sheep. There's this other progression of maturity happening there, of lambs to sheep to feeding the sheep. And we actually, get to, we actually have a glimpse of this mature Peter in the stages where he's feeding the sheep, where his fruit has been growing. He's been moving from here to there, and he's feeding the sheep. In 1 Peter 1, verses 22 and 23, we get to see this mature Peter feeding the sheep. He's writing a letter um, to the different churches, and in it he writes, Since you love each other, then you must love others. And he reverses the progression of the loves there. In the Greek he says, Since you phileo one another, since you have this affectionate love amongst yourself, you must agape love others. Since you, you affectionately phileo love here, unconditionally, self-sacrificially love others. He gets it. Because when this reconciliation happens, when you are reconciled back to God, there is always a call to action to love and to serve others. You see it in Scripture everywhere. In the, when Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? He says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Agape your neighbor as yourself. Live self-sacrificially towards others. In Acts 1.8, you see a similar thing right before he's taken up into heaven. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, here, in Judea, a little bit further, in Samaria, a little bit further, and to the ends of the earth. It's always this call to action. We, we heard it in the, the Great Commission this morning. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is this, always this call to love and serve others when we are reconciled back to God. So what is your here? Where are you this morning? Wherever we are this morning, wherever you are this morning, wherever your here is, The risen Lord meets you here this morning in all his scars, in all your scars. And he, wa- and he doesn't want to leave you here, but he wants you to move you there. He says, do you love me? Follow me. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.